Hi, welcome. I see that we have people joining us. Thank you so much for being here today. We're gonna to take a minute to make sure everyone has time to get signed on. And while we do that, I'm Lisa from the Law Library. I'm gonna do a little bit of housekeeping before I turn the program over to our speakers today. Uh, this is a CLE presentation. And so if you are here, you will be getting a CLE certificate by email this afternoon. I just need to um, open up Zoom and verify who was here and then send those out as soon as the program is over. So be looking for that by email this afternoon. Uh, this is also an interactive presentation, so you have the opportunity to ask questions. I know we have a full program today, lots of material to go over, but um, our, our speakers will try to get to as many of those questions as possible. And we ask that you use the Q&A function to do that. So you'll see a Q&A on your screen with two speech bubbles. That's a place where you can type in questions and you can do that either under your name or anonymously. So um, whatever you are comfortable with. Uh, do be sure to keep the questions general. Our speakers are not here today to give legal advice about specific cases. So um, one more thing, you will see a link to a survey at the end when you leave the program. We would appreciate if some of you would take a few minutes today and give us feedback on the program. We always appreciate any feedback you have to give us. And with that, I'm going to turn things over to Melanie and Joanna. Lisa, thanks so much for hosting us today and for inviting us back to talk about uh, appellate practice. So today we're going to focus on writing more persuasive appellate briefs. And Melanie, I kind of joked a little bit about, you know, the title could be interpreted to write more persuasive briefs, but we wanted you to really write more persuasive briefs. So, um, so that's what we're really here to talk about today. We have a lot of examples to walk you through. And as with any discussion about legal writing, we don't expect you to be able to read and process all of the examples we've given you in the PowerPoint today, um, but we wanted to have them for your further thinking. So we did try to include a lot of examples of um, both what we think is really, um, really great writing and maybe writing that could have benefited from some more thought and editing. And so um, by way of introduction, uh, Lisa, if you can advance to the next slide. Melanie and I are both attorneys with Complex Appellate Litigation Group. So Lisa, I'm not seeing it. In, oh, there we go. Okay, we're caught up. Uh, Complex Appellate Litigation Group, which is a specialty appellate litigation firm. And we have now four offices. As of January, we've just opened an office in Newport Beach. Um, but San Francisco, LA, Newport Beach, and then Melanie and I are the San Diego office. And we work with trial attorneys all the time, either to come in and help do an appeal with you from A to Z, or to provide consulting support uh, on an appeal, research, writing, issue spotting, et cetera. Um, and we work in both state and federal court. We also have writ specialists who've worked inside courts. Um, and a little bit about my background, you can advance to the next slide, Lisa. Um, so I've been practicing uh, litigation on the litigation side for more than 20 years with a specialty in appeals for the last 15, 16 years. Um, I clerked for two federal judges and the experience the contrast I got between um, uh, clerking in the district court in the trial federal trial court and then clerking at the Ninth Circuit really led me to a passion for appellate advocacy and seeing the difference between when you're making the record at the at the trial court um, and then how to persuade on appeal and be an advocate in that um, in that arena and so Melanie I'll turn it over to you to introduce yourself and share some initial thoughts thank you um, thank you all for being here and I'm now in private practice, but for about 30 years, I served as a chamber's attorney at the Fourth District Court of Appeal. And before that, I worked at the California Supreme Court. So I hope to give you some inside perspective and tools to enhance the effectiveness of your brief. So let's go to the next slide. Um, okay, so we wanted to give you a couple of initial thoughts before we get into the guts of, of, the, um, of the program. And, um, First of all, there's no one size fits all for appellate briefing. Each case requires its own strategic and independent approach. And that's why, although I might be proved wrong, I don't think that chat GBT or another artificial intelligence app is going to replace us as written advocates. And that's also why Joanna and I may not always agree on every single point, but you will see there are certain rules of persuasion that apply across the board. And we also wanted to highlight the fundamental differences between a appellate court briefing and trial court briefing, because there are some really important differences you have to be aware of. And one of the most important reasons for that is there's a different audience. Appellate justices, unlike the trial judge, know nothing about your case and may know nothing about the law. 
compared to the trial judge who may have lived with your case for, um, for years. And um, especially there's new appellate justices that may not have practiced in the appellate court for a long time. And so um, they, they may not be familiar with the law. Um, and unlike trial judges, appellate ju justices need to prepare a polished written opinion and they have significant research help in doing so. Also, unlike the trial court, by the time you get to oral argument, the appellate panel will have a pretty finished looking draft in front of it. And although it's not impossible, but it's a pretty uphill battle to change their minds. So what do these differences mean? First of all, when preparing your brief, you need to start from the beginning. Don't drop the justices in the middle of the dispute. And this happens more frequently you think than you may think, and including with experienced practitioners. Second, you need to be meticulous and precise about your factual statement and legal authority and arguments because the research attorney and the justice will be going through that. Third, you need to approach the brief as if you are helping the court prepare a written opinion. When the court um, when the court is reading the briefs, not only are they thinking whether you're persuasive or not, or whether the point is persuasive and whether they're going to affirm or reverse, they're also thinking, how am I going to write this opinion? So to be persuasive, you should be informative and logical and rather than overtly argumentative. And the goal is to have the court copy and paste your brief. Um, Finally, your appellate energy should focus on the written product rather than oral argument, since that's where the justices spend most of their time and make their decisions. The other big difference between appellate briefs and, um, and trial court briefs is the standard of review, which provides the foundation for your written presentation. So rehashing the trial brief um, is often not helpful and may even lead to sanctions if you're ignoring the standard of review. So now we're gonna go through the parts of a brief and Joanna will start with the table of contents. The next slide, please. Thanks, Melanie. And I'll, I'll kind of pick up on one of Melanie's comments that your, your goal here is to be as helpful as possible, right? So as Melanie has framed it, you really would love for the court to be able to take your brief, especially your statement of facts, um, but really translate that into the draft opinion. And really you're writing for the research attorneys and the justices. Um, and so I want to start with the table of contents and style because it was something that was hammered into me at, when I was a very young attorney about how much this matters. And I found that as a law clerk. So my, my path was a little different. I worked in the district court as a law clerk. Then I practiced for three years in doing trial work. And then I went to the circuit court to clerk. And so I had seen a lot of written advocacy in the trial court. Um, but one of the first things that we would start with when reading a brief, and, and so I really make sure this is perfect as an advocate, is the table of contents. So what I would do is I would, as a law clerk, I would line up the three briefs, the opening brief, answering brief, and the reply brief. And I would read the table of contents all the way through to see, okay, what are the major issues? What, what is going on here? And so the better that um, framing of the legal issues, how many legal issues are at stake in, in this case, the better that was framed, the more I knew what, what to look for in the cases. Sometimes the reply brief table of contents would tell me that an issue had been conceded. Okay, I'm still going to, I was still going to read the briefs and read all the issues, but now I would know maybe that's not where I needed to focus all of my energy and attention. So, so really pay attention to your table of contents, Tape, pay attention to what it looks like. And I have an example in the slide um, that I'm going to show you. And so that's also where style and formatting really come into play. So take great care at the end before you finalize and file your brief. That it, that it is readable, that the font all matches, that all of your um, Roman numeral and lettering, that that is all in order so that someone could open your table of contents and read the story of your case and understand it as a map. Um, and then a couple of other things, um, you know, Melanie and I both have experience in both state court and federal court. In the state courts, you should be using California style manual in your brief. Um, even though you are also permitted to use Blue Book, the rules allow you to use both. But think about making the justices' lives easier. They are going to use California style manual. And so if you use the CSM in your state court briefs, then again, they can use your brief as a starting point. Um, and then in federal court, you use the Blue Book. And so I, I will say when I saw briefs that were filed in California style manual, I thought, oh, they don't practice in federal court. So you don't want someone to pick up your brief and think you are a rookie um, because of these style choices. So I'm going to show you a quick example on the next slide, please, um, of what a great table of contents is going to look like. 
So I know it's a little small, but you can go back and study this. In this case, I was raising um, a novel issue under 1717, which is attorney's fees. And our, our goal was to convince the appellate court that it didn't authorize an interim award of attorney's fees because that's what the trial court had done given a 1.1 million dollar fee award in the middle of a case before it was resolved and so you see that i have outlined that issue very clearly in my table of contents and then i have four sub arguments outlined and when you when you go through the sub arguments what you'll see is i have given the court a clear roadmap of what each of the sub arguments are and, and so they know the sum total of what our challenges are going to be. And it's also formatted impeccably. So that I just wanted to give you an example of what that looks like. And you can read through that. Um, you can read through that more later. So Melanie, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. Next slide. And I, I agree with the table of contents. I think that they are they don't seem like they're important, but they're critical. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about using effective introductions, and I'm going to talk about some basic rules and have a bunch of examples, and then Joanna will discuss more nuances and advanced approaches. So the most important thing of a, an effective introduction is to have one. It's really, I, I want to say it's the most important part of your brief. The purpose is, is to draw the court in so the court will understand your appeal and start thinking if you're the appellant, something wrong happened, or if you're the respondent, everything was fine. The court reads it first and the justices and the research attorney, and it's a way to get them into the, the rest of the case. So what, the, what you an introduction should do is to convey in simple and plain language what the case is about, what's the appellate issue, why the court should rule in your favor, and what you're seeking and make it interesting and readable so the court will want to continue reading the brief. If the court can't understand what's going on, the court will put that brief down, go to the opposing party, and you've just lost all your persuasive value and, and, and um, tools. So also, make it concise. Get to the point quickly. It's not a summary of arguments. It should be one or two paragraphs at the most. And it's not a summary of the law. And as Justice Froelich used to say, Think elevator moments when you're thinking about how to write a, an introduction. Somebody asks you, what is the case about and why you should prevail? In one or two minutes, you, you say it and think about that as the introduction. The most frequent mistake in the introductions is you start in the middle. You plop the justices right in the middle and you've been with the case for a long time, but the justices know nothing about it. Another frequent problem is style. We're gonna talk about that a little bit and showing examples. And the, these style problems applies across the board, but they can be particularly glaring in the introduction. Make the introduction readable. And if I can give you two writing tips for the introduction and everything else, be simple and be informative. Simplicity is the key to persuasiveness. It doesn't mean you have to, to um, sacrifice complex ideas, but it means presenting your facts, arguments, introduction in a straightforward and understandable way. Use plain language, simple words, short sentences, short paragraphs. Have a non-lawyer read your introduction and see if they understand what you're saying. Um, and then being informative means persuading through providing information and not emotion or conclusory assertions. Don't use contract style of introductions, which we'll get into. So I'm gonna give you some examples. These are from actual briefs. The names are changed. They're pretty extreme, but I think they demonstrate some of the points that I just said. So the next slide, um, this is an example of what not to do. <laughs> um, this is a criminal case. I mean, when I first started out, this is a lot of the criminal briefs would start out this way as their introduction. They don't do it as much anymore, thankfully. But you can see that the judge will look at this for two minutes and go, I have no idea what this case is about. This is just a listing of the counts, the dates, the procedure. But it doesn't uh, meet any of the things that I was telling you in an introduction to do. Also notice the all caps in the first line. See how your line eye stops there and makes the sentence less readable? Imagine reading a novel with all caps. It would be slow going. Let's go to the next slide and I'll show you a, a better way. This was rewritten. So the same case as the first one, um, a, a jury found the defendant whoops, um, committed numerous crimes. So the first sentence just summarizes all those crimes as burglary and identity theft. The next paragraph says what the issue is. We're talking about a motion to suppress, and this raises the point of a warrantless vehicle search. The court would be thinking, uh-oh, a, a warrantless search is 
could be problematic. The next sentence talks about a stale information that makes it even more problematic. And then the last sentence under settled health the United States Supreme Court authority, and you don't have to um, set it out because you will in your argument, the search was unconstitutional and the evidence must be suppressed. So that is a very complete and it's readable. And it's a, I, I think it's a good introduction for a, an appellate brief. And the next slide, um, this slide it, um, illustrates popping the justices in the middle and failing to give them context. If you, you're looking at it now, this is about as much time as the, the judges start re reading it. It's very confusing. You know, there was some kind of easement involved and a jury, but no context, no detail. And it just it's way too much information to get the justices to understand what the case is about. What this case was, at, and this is an actual objection, what the case was actually about was two Rancho Santa Fe neighbors fighting over a tiny triangle of, of uh, property. And there was an issue was about historic use. And so that, and then the question is, is whether there was evidence to support it and whether there's some evidentiary errors. That's what you should say rather than putting all this in the introduction. After reading the introduction, the court would very likely go to the other side to find out what's going on. So this is ineffective. Um, the next slide, um, this next slide, example three. Um, okay, go to the next slide. Okay, that this example is an example of a contract styled introduction. It's defining all the terms and all the parties. It's providing abbreviations in all caps. It's not, it's not helpful, it's not readable. It's just saying that there was a lot of plaintiffs saying their names in all caps, what the first amendment class complaint was and all the causes of action. Go to the next slide. This is a more effective way of doing it. There's no citations in here, but you're getting the information you need to cross. Plaintiffs filed a class action complaint alleging several statutory consumer claims causing personal injuries. Okay, so you know, the judge knows in plain language where you are. The next couple of sentences start talking about that there's a statute of limitations problem. And then the last paragraph says the key fact, plaintiffs admit they were aware of their injuries, you know, in 20, um, I can't read that there, but in earlier and more than six years before filing their complaint, trial court error. So this is a, an effective introduction. You might want at the very end say what you want, but it's in plain language and compare those two when you have time. Next slide. Um, this one is a respondent's brief and it's, it's very ineffective um, because it uses all kinds of um, terms to try and it does, it's not specific. For example, the second sentence, in addition to relying upon unsupported evidence and perfunctory analysis, Smith resorts to a plethora of logical fallacies, including but not limited to ad hoc reasoning, argument by assertion, argumentative uh, ad nauseum, and on and on. That, you know, you could say that in one sentence, you can say um, that the, the appellant relies on facts that are not in the record and engages in personal attacks. You're not trying to prove that you know all these Latin terms to the court. You're, you just wanna say in plain language, what is wrong with it? The other problem with this, it doesn't provide specifics. And, and, and another, the main problem is that it's not affirmative. The respondent's introduction should be affirmative because the, the court, as I was saying, has to prepare an opinion. Their opinion is not going to just be why the other side's wrong. They have to say why you're right. And so you have to help them and say why the trial judge did the right thing. Affirmative in your introduction. Um, okay, and so the last um, slide for introductions. Um, this is a, a slide about dial. Um, so the first sentence, just read the first five words. The tort case here and in the above entitled appeal. Numbness. I don't, you know, what are you talking about? This blog, you know, it's not, it doesn't have anything specific. And then when you get to the third line about, you know, talking, naming the, in all caps, Smith Modern Foods Inc., DBA Modern Foods, here and after referred to as SMF. That is very common and it's very unhelpful because you're not going to remember what SMF is and you're going to, you could call them the defendant or restaurant even better. Yeah, and you don't have to define them in the introduction. And then, that, then you go into defining the California Department of Alcohol and Beverages, DAB. You don't even mention them again in the paragraph. You don't have to do that. So this, this does not get you in the case. It's, it's, it's written in a way that is not clear. It uses all caps, abbreviations, unhelpful acronyms. So the better, here's the one, there's many other ways you could do it, but here's a better way. The issue here is novel. 
Okay, so this interesting, a novel issue. Appellate courts like that. A minor lied about her age to purchase liquor at a restaurant. As a direct result, the restaurant owner's liquor license was suspended. Is the minor responsible for the restaurant's lost profits? Under settled California law, the answer is no. So that makes the court knows what the issue is. It's interesting. They know it's a first impression issue and it will get them into the brief. So those are my examples for now. I have a lot of others, but <laughs> okay. Joanna, next slide for Joanna. And so building on what Melanie was talking about, and here's one place where I have a slight disagreement. Um, she says one to two paragraphs, and I think she's given you some great examples of how you could do that. My introductions tend to be a little longer because I also favor using a narrative introduction. And so this is kind of a, another sort of advanced technique. Um, and I'm going to show an example in just a moment of one where Melanie and I uh, worked on, a, on, on an amicus brief together. And I think it's a good example of a narrative introduction. Um, but, but mine tend to be a little longer. And then as Melanie mentioned, I always ask at the end of my introduction for the relief I want. You know, respectfully, we're requesting that the court reverse um, and do the following, or um, you know, we request that the court affirm the judgment. And and I want to be sure that I'm stating that relief. So, um, using narrative introductions as a persuasive tool. So yes, you want to identify the case and the issue and draw the reader in in all the ways that Melanie just explained, um, and 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 situate them in the case. But I also think the brain science really supports telling a story, an effective story to draw the reader in. And, and I think that's a lot of what Melanie was illustrating. And so um, I never approach an introduction chronologically. I want to, to frame a story and draw the reader in. So I'm gonna give you an example of that on the next slide. So this is a case where Melanie and I were representing an amicus organization. And the case, just before you start reading, the case is about the, the California statute that has a minimum gender diversity requirement on corporate boards. And so we're, we were not, we're not one of the parties, but we represent an organization, California Women Lawyers. That's an organization of professional, of professional women. And it was their position um, to support the, the statute and to provide some concrete examples of why that, that statute um, made sense, both on the facts and the law. And so here's how we started our narrative introduction. The first two female corporate directors in the United States were Clara Abbott in 1900 and Leslie Pate Whitehead in 1934, both of whom had husbands who were the corporation's founders. Despite these early appointments, during the next 84 years of public corporate boards remain bastions of men. By 2018, when SB 826 was enacted, and the court already knows what that statute is because it has the principal briefs, only a small percentage of California public company boards seats were held by women and 29% of California companies had no women on their boards of directors. So the reason Melanie and I started that brief with that story is because we wanted to catch the reader's attention. We wanted to focus on the role of women in corporate boards and how they had been excluded for so long and that there were 29% of companies that had at this state when the law was passed, no women on their boards. And so we then go on and say, we wanted to talk about what the legislature did and why it mattered to the story. So we say in enacting SB 826, the legislature found the gross underrepresentation of women on California company, public company boards results from discrimination based on pernicious stereotype types and impenetrable walls of discrimination. We're quoting the legislature there because we're defending the statute inherent in the secretive and closed network board appointment process. Next slide. And so we have another description of what the legislature has done. It found the barriers are self-perpetuating and will not be disrupted without governmental action. And in response to these and other findings, the legislature adopted SB 826 as necessary. And the reason we're using all of these is because these are keywords for what, the, what has to be proven to defend the statute. A necessary step to remove the obstacles to women's full participation in the boardroom and global economy. And then we have the paragraph here, as I was just describing about what we want. Why are we here and what do we want? So here, California Women Lawyers submits this brief to provide context on the discriminatory structural barriers, leading corporations to exclude women from their boardrooms and to explain the need for governmental action to remedy past discrimination and halt ongoing discrimination against women at the highest levels of business leadership and to highlight the many experienced and well-qualified women who are willing and able to serve on public company boards. 
we then in our brief, if I showed you the table of contents, that was each of the arguments that we made. We set the court up, we situated them in the story, and then we set the court up for each of the points we as an amicus were gonna, were gonna bring in. We were gonna provide context, we were gonna explain the need for governmental action, and then we were gonna provide examples of how the statute was both successful, but why it needed to continue, and that there was a pool of well-qualified women ready to serve. But it didn't take us 10 pages to explain that. It took us one page to explain that. So hopefully that, that gives you at least one solid example of what a narrative storytelling focused introduction can look like. And I will turn it back over to Melanie. And we used plain language. You see, it's not talking about, you know, it's not quoting a lot of things that we had one tiny quote, but it's using plain language to draw the court in. And so that's exactly, I, I, I liked this introduction, yeah. And, it, and as we said, each case requires strategic thinking. It, it depends. And, um, but thinking shorter rather than longer is better for the court. So I'm giving you the court point of view. But this one was, I liked it. thought it was really helpful and persuasive. And the court actually quoted us it, in its opinion. So yeah. Um, OK, so next slide. Are we on? Yeah, OK. So we're on the facts now. And um, this is another really important section. Um, because this is the court doesn't know the facts and, and doesn't want to go read the entire record at to start out with. You have your chance to be persuasive and to explain the facts in the story. So the most important thing with the factual section is to be objective and accurate. And, and Joanna's going to talk about accuracy because that's maybe the most important. But um, in terms of being objective, this is not the place to be argumentative. Let the court draw the conclusions. For example, if you say there's only one witness that saw the light and it was red, testified it was red, don't then go on to say, and all, then all the other, you know, then the jury verdict was absolutely wrong or anything. Let the court draw that conclusion. Just state the facts objectively. At the end of the facts section, the court should want to rule in your favor. Trust the court to make the necessary inferences, and it's a much more powerful way of persuading if you let the court make that inference. Um, think hard about your story and tell it in a coherent and interesting way. And just a couple, you know, I mean, that this would have a, be a whole seminar, but just a couple of tips on, on telling a story effectively in terms of style. Don't go witness by witness. Um, that that uh, you need to put it together for the court, and it, it's just it's not helpful, and it doesn't create a story in the court's mind. Um, eliminate the irrelevant facts. So many briefs and facts you're going through and there's dates and people's names and, and locations and addresses and you're writing all this down as a research attorney or a justice. And it comes to the end and you don't, you didn't get the big picture because you think those details are important. So when you first write it, of course you put those in because that's how you're thinking, but then get rid of those. Maybe instead of a date put three months later or something like that, or a week later or a day later, and just try to get rid of details that are unnecessary. But there's an exception to that, and we call them the grandmother facts of the court. There was one case where there was a grandmother sitting in a room where something happened. And that actually, the, in the opinion, we talked about the grandmother, not that it was central, but it gave context to the story. So sometimes you are going to put some facts that are not completely relevant, but that make the story better. And then with procedural facts, integrate the facts into your story if you need them. You don't need to put procedural facts, particularly in civil cases, but um, you can you can integrate them if they're important and don't put them separate because they're mind numbing if they're separate. Um, and don't don't rehash your trial brief facts because this the appellate story is likely different and that's why it's helpful to have an appellate attorney or to have somebody else kind of tell when you're a trial attorney you get so involved in the credibility issue or the identity issue and you want to get stepped back and what is the story with respect to what the issues are, the legal issues um, on appeal. And um, I have an example for you and I'll tell an interesting story too. So, but I have an example for you on how to tell your story in a way that's objective and at the same time persuasive to your point of view. So look at the two, okay, so there, is, there are two, um, it's the same story, but there's um, two different courts, the Eighth Circuit, Court of Appeal and um, one from the United States Supreme Court on the same case. 
And um, the case concerned whether the defendant was entrapped into buying pornographic materials. And this is the same standard of review, the same facts, but they portrayed them in a different way. So let's go to the next slide and look at this is People versus Jacobson, Jackson. Jacobson, people versus Jacobson. So go to the next slide. And we're not going to read this whole thing, but we're going to look at the first sentence. Um, when police searched a California pornography bookstore, they discovered Jacobson had ordered two magazines featuring photos of nude adolescent boys um, listing se selling sexually explicit materials. And later down there, you get a discussion of oral sex, anal sex, heavy masturbation. 11 and 12, 14 year old boys and not to be surprised, but these are all facts, they're accurate and not to be surprised, they, they rejected the entra entrapment defense in this case. Now, when you go to the United States Supreme Court in the next slide, um, they start out um, with, um, and the same facts again, but they started out with in February, 1984, petitioner, uh, a 56 year old veteran turned farmer who supported his elderly father in Nebraska, ordered two magazines and a brochure from a California adult bookstore. The magazines entitled Bear Boys and Bear Boys 2 contained photographs of nude preteen and teenage boys. So they're not ignoring the bad facts, but they're, they're, put, they're putting them inside of good facts. Next sentence is, the contents of the magazine startled petitioner who testified that he had expected to receive photographs of young men 18 years or older. So that, and not to be surprised that this court uh, reject, said that, that there was, that validated the entrapment defense here. Um, because, and the, you can tell from the way they're, they're um, presenting the facts. And it's the same way an attorney in a brief can present the facts this way. Now you see the date and I said, get rid of dates, but actually this date, February, 1984 was really important because there was a change in the law. So the next paragraph is talking about when he ordered them and that it was it was after it was before the law was changed. So go back and read those cases and see different, how a story can really affect how you're thinking about the legal issue. Um, yeah, so next slide and I'll let Joanna talk more about facts, factual questions. Here to build on what Melanie was talking about, you know, telling a story with your with your statement of facts. I want to talk about a couple of key tips. Um, being accurate and complete gives you credibility. And so, what I mean by that is that um, it it sort of surprises me even today reading briefs where an, an assertion will be made and there will be no factual record citation to support it, and that that really is a red flag. So you should have you should have a supporting citation for every assertion that you make, um, and if you don't, um, that's the the reader is going to think, oh well, why aren't they directing me to the point in the record where I can verify that? And then if you do provide a record site, make sure you've double checked it and that everything is accurate, because the second worst thing to do is cite something that that doesn't support what you're saying or that's the wrong. Um, record citation, because if I am picking that up and when I was a law clerk or opposing counsel, um, you know, I think your credibility starts to get really undermined if if they can't verify what you're saying. And if it happens more than once, um, you know, I think your credibility really is shot. So um, the next key tip I have is to include what's necessary for the legal issue and the story. And so as Melanie was saying, don't don't run from bad facts. Um, you need to you need to include that. But what you also need to think about in strategically writing and then editing your your statement of facts is, um, and it, you sort of got this when I talked about our introduction. We had done all the research. We had already anticipated our issues, and we were we're we're going to then tell the statement of facts or frame the statement of facts to highlight what facts are necessary for the legal issues and to tell the story to draw the reader in. And then if something isn't relevant to that. We're going to delete those in in the editing of, of the statement of facts and um i think melanie gave a really elegant elegant example of how you can acknowledge bad facts but you may be situating them in in part of the story and good facts but don't simply leave bad facts out or push them all to footnotes because the reader knows exactly what you're doing when you when you do that and and that again is something that will undermine your credibility 
And then lastly, if you have a preservation issue, so if you realize um, when you're working with appellate counsel or as you are preparing your brief on appeal, if you realize that during the you know, pace of litigation, you didn't preserve something in the way that you wish you had because of, of the way that the issues came up, you need to acknowledge that. Don't ignore it because the court is going to figure it out. And you want to have your framing of what that preservation um, issue is. And so it's on that that I'm going to give you an example. But before we go to the next slide, um, I left one thing out of my discussion of, of um, uh, introductions, but I think it's relevant both to the statement of facts and legal argument that we'll get to in a minute. You know, I always fall back to um, Aristotle's, you know, pillars of rhetoric, ethos, logos, pathos. And so you should always be thinking about um, the ethical appeal, that's ethos. So how can I be ethical? You need to have credibility as the author for the court to trust what you're saying. You also need to be logical, the logos piece. So you need to present a logical flow and a logical argument um, for, the, for the court to find it persuasive. And then finally, you don't wanna skip over pathos, which is the emotional appeal. That's where telling the story and drawing the reader in and the last example Melanie just gave about the way the Supreme Court um, framed that case was a much more emotional appeal that led to the result, as, as she explained, of upholding that, that uh, entrapment defense. You could tell it by the inter introduction to their statement of facts. So, um, so let's go to the example that I wanted to show about one way to acknowledge a preservation issue. So just a little bit about this case when it's the case that I mentioned before where we were challenging an attorney fee issue and it was um, it was sort of a surprise that it happened in the middle of the case and so there wasn't a lot of challenge um, on the issue that we eventually constructed a statutory challenge and so I had to search the record high and low to find that challenge uh, that it was preserved and there was a tiny little briefing on it in an ex party issue where um, trial counsel below had said that, okay, this issue should wait until the end of the case, um, but they didn't raise that issue actually in opposing the attorney fee motion. Instead, they had just raised it in an ex parte and the court didn't even rule on the ex parte, but instead went and ruled in the, on the merits of the attorney fee brief. Well, we turned that into, this is where the issue was preserved. Um, it was preserved um, in, in this ex parte where, the, where our client did in fact say that it should wait till the end of the case. And, and we, we drew that out for the court so that we could point to that. Alternatively, we argued, and even if, it, if you don't think that that was preservation, we are asking you solely to rule on a legal issue. And so you can rule on it in the first instance. But, but we didn't wanna skate over that and just raise our legal issue because we knew that one natural way to oppose our appeal was for the other to side to say that it had been forfeited because it had not been raised be below and they had only, um, trial counsel had only responded on the merits of the attorney fee issue. So, so we made a lot of, we made a big deal about that ex party and the court of appeal in its opinion, ruling in favor of our clients and overturning that fee award, essentially took what we wrote about that ex party and said, it was preserved in the case this way. So the trial court knew that there was a challenge to the prematurity on the prematurity issue. And by the way, it's a legal issue and we're gonna rule on it anyway. But you wanna give the court every logical step that it needs to rule in your favor. And that should all be lined up in your statement of facts. Don't, don't skirt over anything that could pose a challenge for you in your case. Melanie, I think you're up. I think you actually are next on um, the argument section. Okay, it's me. It's back to me. I lied. Okay, so you <laughs> talked about the, uh, okay, so I think you're on the next slide, actually. Yes, okay, so I actually, um, I had a whole slide on this, and uh, so as you can go back, Lisa, um, to, the, to the previous slide. So I already addressed this. Um, I, ha I guess I wanted to hit on this point in two different places. Um, the ethical appeal, the logical appeal, and the emotional appeal. So again, you need to think about constructing this from the very first um, portion of your of your introduction, whether you decide to dip your toe in the narrative introduction, um, and then think about it as you're constructing your statement of facts. And it's really important as you are moving into your legal argument section. Um, so Lisa, next slide. So the next um, sort of advanced uh, argument that I, or the or tip that I'll provide is really, really spend time thinking about issue selection and how you're gonna order your issues. And this is gonna tie into the discussion of standard of review, which Melanie is gonna talk about um, in detail. But 
prioritizing your strongest issue, you, you don't want to just do your issues chronologically. And I also recommend you not kitchen sink everything that went wrong. You may have litigated this case for five years and you know what went wrong in five years. But to be honest, there's only two or three things that went wrong that actually mattered to the outcome. And that is what you need to synthesize and identify for the court. If you have a brief in a civil case, now criminal has, I'm going to give a distinction for criminal cases, but if you have a civil appeal and you are raising nine issues, it is too many. So maybe you wanted to research them all and evaluate and, and write them all so that you can look at them all and your client can understand them all. But you should be synthesizing those issues down to your strongest points based on the standard of review and where you think you can show the strongest harm. Now, this is if you're an appellant. If you're the respondent, obviously your approach is, is going to be responding to the issues raised. Um, but but um, when we get into the discussion of the standard of review, I think it's going to be more even more clear. De novo is what you're aiming for. So you want to you want to raise you know your strongest issue is one where the court is going to take an independent review of your case. Now the distinction I'm going to make in criminal cases is um, if you if you litigate criminal cases, you need to raise every issue, right? That doesn't mean that you don't prioritize your best issues. You still need to prioritize your best issues, but you need to raise every single issue that your client might want to be preserved for further review in the California Supreme Court, further review in federal court on a habeas petition. So we call that federalizing issues um, or potentially raising an issue that could be you, you could be seeking um, you know, federal intervention down the road. So you don't want to waive um, you don't want to waive anything for, for a, a criminal client in a direct appeal. So that's kind of a, a different scenario, but in a civil case, and I will tell you, it is one of the hardest things to do is to let go of an issue because people really want to cover everything. But Melanie, I think you would agree that that if, if someone is raising too many issues, most of which are weak, it, it undermines their best issue. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah and yes, so I, I think that that is so true because institutionally, you have a certain amount of time, the research attorney, to write the draft opinion. And so you give a certain amount of time to each issue. If there are nine issues, you divide your time. And so you're giving way smaller um, time to the really important issue. And sometimes I've, you know, we've done that in, in, in an opinion. And then later on, I saw one, a case addressing the first issue for the entire case. And I saw how much more in depth they could get. So yes, that's really good advice. And the other thing just very quickly is about emotional appeal. I, I think it's, it is, don't ignore that to, to talk about some unfairness because although that might not be a legal you know, basis for reversal, that will make the court a lot more interested in working through and finding a way. And, and I, I have an example of a case that won't we'll talk about in detail right now, but where that happened at the court where because there was an unfairness, the court searched and finally found a way to be able to reverse. So get to the standard of review. I know we don't have a lot of time today. Um, I'll, I'll turn it over to you now to go into depth on that. Okay. Um, yes, and the standard of the next slide, please. Um, the standard of, re okay, the next slide. That's, that's a good move. Um, so the standard of review, we could give an hour talk on that. So we're not, we're not going to. So I'm going to just try to be really basic. I don't know where how experienced all of you are, but um, the basic thing that that even experienced practitioners forget is what is a standard of review? Often they, they mix it up with the prejudice standard. A standard of review measures the degree of deference that appellate court gives to the trial court. Are they bound by the opinion or can they just do independent a review on it. That's really critical. That's the foundation for an appellate court's review. And there's um, three standards. Um, there's the de novo, substantial evidence, and abuse of discretion. And just very briefly, uh, it's really important when you're even thinking about taking a case to understand these, to see taking a case to an appeal, whether there's any chance of prevailing. And um, a de novo there's no deference given because it's a question of law. For example, on a contract interpretation, statutory construction. Substantial evidence is a factual question and it, you, there's very deferential. You almost always infirm unless there's no credible evidence. And that's because the trial court is the experts in facts and the jury and the, the appellate court is experts in questions of law. So you think about why 
and that helps you understand if there's if the, the standard review is not clear. Um, the other one is the abuse of discretion, which is very similar, very lots of um, deference given. There's been lots of articles written about the difference between abuse of discretion and substantial evidence, which we won't get into, but um, it's, it usually applies to procedural facts. And um, often there's mixed questions of law and fact, and that's another thing you should be look out for. Um, in, in terms of writing, and then that's the topic here, is I always identify the appropriate standard, um, but don't discuss it at length. I, there are many uh, there are many briefs that they go on and on about what de novo means or what substantial evidence means. The court knows that. The court does this in every opinion, and we, we talk about it. So don't spend, waste your time or waste the court's time. It just irritates them. Um, the other thing is, is don't state the standard of review and then forget it. Keep, use it and keep it in mind when you're writing your brief. For example, if you're arguing a discretionary abuse of discretion, which is difficult, but you're going to want to discuss in the facts and in the legal argument um, that the, what, the facts showing the court's was finding was arbitrary. So if it's arbitrary, then it's abuse of discretion. So use that language. And then this, and then if there's if the standard is a de novo, and Joanna will talk about different ways of kind of a, a converting those, but if it is a de novo, don't spend a lot of time saying how terrible the court's reasoning is. I, I used to see that a lot because the court, it's an independent review. So we don't care what the court said on the summary judgment. The court is just looking at what the result was and then it conducts its own reasoning. So don't waste your brief in attacking the trial court's decision. Um, and um, I, that's all I will say for now, given the time. So I'll let Joanna talk about some more advanced things in standard of review. Sure, next slide, please. So I'm really gonna focus on your legal argument. And this is, this is probably advice you've heard before, but you know, I just want to make the, the drive the point home. Leverage your best authority. Um, you don't want to necessarily just like issue selection and prioritization. You don't want to bog the court down in a lot of extraneous authority. So leverage your best authority, and then weave the relevant cases into the argument. When I'm reading um, briefs that are, are less persuasive, it's just it'll just be case, 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 facts. And so I think it's much more persuasive if you can weave the, the the cases so so analogize to why your story fits with the cases that are really helpful and persuasive um it, and and that that is what then as the reader is reading along oh your your story your presentation of, of the legal argument makes so much more sense and seems like it's the obvious result for the court so that's really an advanced um an advanced technique and it takes a lot of um effort in terms of both framing your argument and editing if you or if your instinct is to just summarize the authority, go back in your editing and writing and make sure that you're weaving the cases into into the argument along with your facts. I also think that the next mistake people make is that they they write parentheticals that are so long that you've lost the court. If your parenthetical is more than a couple of lines visually, I would suggest to you you reconsider actually discussing the case in more detail. Um, and that, but one effective way, one a technique that I use is if I've introduced the case earlier on in the argument, um, but then I want to re reiterate it later in a parenthetical. The the court's already familiar with the case, and so I can you know then say in the parenthetical you know reversing for da 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 and give that example later, and I can have a much shorter parenthetical because I'm not trying to describe the entire case just in the parenthetical. So think about the balance of not overwhelming. Um, with with really long parentheticals, and then be sure to address negative authority. And the way I like to do that um, is to is to use a CF site. Um, I don't just put all the negative cases in in the footnotes, but I'll do a compare site, um, or I'll acknowledge it depending on how negative it is. Um, I might just straight up acknowledge it, but otherwise I may have three cases that are favorable and then have a CF site, a compare site that then says, but C or a but C site that says, you know, these two cases which hold the other, you know, or articulate a slightly different rule. And so I think that that's, um, it, again, it goes back to credibility. You want to be sure the court and the research attorney that they're not sort of doing their own research and then come up with those negative cases and say, why didn't you disclose those cases? And instead, if you have, um, offered the cases and given your spin on what the cases are or been upfront with the fact that they're negative, I think you end up with a lot more credibility from the person reading your brief, um, but they understand that you framed it in a way that look at all this positive authority 
or why these other cases are distinguishable, even if they're negative. Um, so I do have two examples I want to walk you through um, that are sort of more advanced application of legal argument. And so Lisa, if we can go to the next slide. So this one is um, about, I think, effectively using legal authority. So this was a slap appeal and it's an anti-slap case. And um, in this case, I represented the appellant and we, we were really focused on the first prong of slap, uh, the anti-slap statute. And so um, I had already you know, explained uh, the argument, but what I did here was really weave in um, the cases into the argument. So part of what I was trying to drive home with the court was that the trial court didn't spend very much time on the first prong and instead jumped sec right to the second prong. But we really found, we, we were really arguing that our client would win on the first prong had the court taken the time to analyze it. Because it was de novo review, we, we were trying to get the court really interested in that, um, that step of the analysis. So here, here's what I said. The trial court's abbreviated analysis on the first prong. So again, framing, framing the issue as the court didn't really look at it very thoroughly. Um, it didn't thoroughly examine the thrust of, of substantive allegations in the first amended complaint was legally erroneous. Again, that is de novo, right? So as Melanie said, don't set and forget your standard of review, use it in your argument. Legally erroneous under established anti-slap principles requiring courts to, to, to focus on, and then I have the quote, um, this is one of the one of the best cases for us. Um, to, the principal thrust or gravamen of the plaintiff's causes of action to evaluate whether the protected activity was the alleged injury producing act that formed the basis for the cause of action. This is the heart of the argument. And I will tell you, this is where the court ended up reversing in favor of my client on prong one. And then the court of appeal never even had to reach prong two because they already found that that it had not satis been satisfied on prong one. So this is drilling right into the favorable legal authority and effectively using it to construct and frame the argument. So you can go back and read more about that example. And if you wanted to read, I have the case number there. If you wanted to read the court's opinion, you can, you can match that to, um, to the analysis. And then I have one more example I'll walk you through. Um, next slide. So we've talked a lot about the appellant's perspective. Melanie had some good um, examples in her introductions that could be a respondent's brief, but um, I didn't wanna leave that out. So I wanted to give you, if you're representing the party who won below, give you a way to, um, to see an effective use of the standard of review in your favor when it is a deferential standard. So going back to the substantial evidence standard, in this case, um, the, the probate court had made a factual finding that something was a, a gift and not a loan. And my client wanted it to be a gift and not a loan, and they had won in, in the trial court. And so our goal in the brief was to hammer that factual finding home at every turn, that there was support in the record for the court's factual finding. And so this is how we frame that argument. Appellant's brief doesn't contain any discussion of the applicable standard of review Red flag, red flag, right? Which is discussed above is the highly deferential substantial evidence standard. And, and so we say instead they re-argue the evidence and ask this court to indulge their version of events and inferences. That was rejected by the trial court. They misunderstand their burden on appeal since the judgment will be upheld if there's any substantial evidence to support the trial court's findings and judgment. So again, that's framing the case in a way favorable to, to the standard of review if you're defending and leveraging it. And in this case, um, my client was able to successfully defend uh, on appeal and, and get the Court of Appeal to affirm. So, Melanie, I think you're going to talk next about prejudice, right? Yes, I'll just a couple of tiny points on the, on the um, legal arguments um, with parentheticals. Don't use them if the, if the, if the matter is well settled. It, it, that, many people do that and it, it clutters your mind. You don't, there's way overuse of parentheticals. Research unpublished authority in the dis court you are at because the court will the court attorneys will research it and they know what that law is. Make sure that you're aware of it and use it if you can if it's helpful to you. Um, and then on but C's, I wouldn't just put a but C. I would explain that the negative authority and and or try to distinguish it somehow because I, I think that that that's more helpful. Um, and um, yeah, I know I have to move on to prejudice, so let's go to prejudice. Um, okay, so um, in almost every case, the appellant has to show prejudicial error, which means um, show the outcome would have been different. 
And it's a constitutional standard. You can see the site there. And it generally, it's a reasonably probable standard. Um, there are exceptions. Um, and the reasonably probable standard comes from People versus Watson. And um, But if it's a federal constitutional error, it's beyond, or you have to prove prejudicial, that it wasn't prejudicial beyond a reasonable doubt. The other side, the other side, if the court erred, the other side has to show that beyond a reasonable doubt that there was no prejudice. Um, and then sometimes for structural errors, you don't have to show any prejudice, but that's so rare. I wouldn't focus on that. So this is another one of the most important parts of the brief. It's very frequent reason for affirmance. Um, it's not that hard to find an error, particularly in a long trial, but it's very difficult to find an error that would have changed the outcome. So it's critical to include the prejudice argument and it requires you to review the entire record when evaluating prejudice. It's now when I worked, a former justice I worked for used to say, um, when, um, when there was a close question as to prejudice, he would say, let's both read the closing arguments, opening and closing, and really get a feel. And he say, it's a judgment call. Let's get a feel for whether the jury was influenced by this error. So you want to be able to, in your argument, you want to talk about the read and be, you know, the closing arguments, the opening arguments, the jury instructions, the jury notes, just every part of the argument to marshal it to argue the error. And um, this is important for not only, you know, the brief writing, but when you're just designating portions of the record. And also when you're talking about the factual state. If you have a standard, if, you're, if you are challenging the substantial evidence, the, the factual statement generally has to be in the light most favorable to the other, the party that won. But if you also have a prejudice argument, you can expand that and talk about um, issues that are in your favor, talk about facts that are in your favor so that you will marshal the arguments on the prejudice. Um, looking at the time, so. Yeah, okay, so I, we want to leave time for questions. So I'll, I'll let um, Joanna finish up. So our final points are about the conclusion. And I am surprised how many people waste the opportunity to have um, a, a persuasive conclusion. So my advice to you, don't waste the opportunity. Um, but Melanie and I had a discussion about also not regurgitating your entire argument and don't reframe it in a way that's inconsistent with your with your uh, brief. So essentially quickly restate why you should win and then ask for the relief you want. It's shocking to me how many times people don't tell the court what they want. And you will actually hear a federal and state court appellate judges tell writers of briefs, uh, lawyers, please tell us what relief you're seeking from us. It, we don't wanna have to you know, divine what it is you're asking for. So I have one example of that on the next slide. In this um, in this case, here was what we asked for um, the trial court. So in this case, the trial court had set aside a default judgment and um, and we wanted the court to overturn that that ruling and reenter the default. So what we said was in the very last paragraph, the court should reverse the order setting aside the default judgment and writ of execution and remand with directions that the trial court enter an order denying the motion to set aside the default judgment and reentering that judgment with further attorney's fees, costs, and interest to be determined on remand. Super clear. We want you to overturn the order uh, that, that uh, set aside the default and the writ of execution. We want you to direct the trial court to re-enter the default judgment and then give us the chance to brief costs and fees. And then uh, the next slide will tell you, will show you exactly what the court did. Yes, the court did exactly what we asked. The order granting the motion is set aside uh, to set aside the default is reversed. The case is remanded to the trial court with directions to enter an order denying the motion to set aside the default judgment and re-enter the default judgment and writ of execution and that we won costs. So again, don't waste the opportunity uh, in your conclusion to, to persuasively leave the court at the very end. And you should really be thinking about this um, when, the, when you're closing your oral argument, what you would say you wanted from the court, right? You should be thinking about that when you're writing your conclusion for your opening brief. What are you going to say to the court in that last 30 seconds? Your honors, this is what I'm asking the court to do. You should have thought about that and written it in your conclusion already. Um, yeah, I just want to say that we, the court attorneys spend a lot of time on dispositions and they talk about them a lot. And it's it's not necessarily a straightforward thing. And so the more you can help. And in the conclusion section, this is the important point. Summary, 
I, I would say as an attorney and for the justice, it's not that helpful. Just say what you want in the conclusion, my opinion. Um, and so I, I think we just had one more slide, which is um, if you have any questions that we didn't answer today, I think we answered both of the ones that came up in Q&A. Um, I answered them typing in an answer, um, but you can always email Melanie or myself. We had our email addresses in the first couple of slides. Um, just to reiterate a couple of points about bringing in an appellate specialist. We can help, um, you know, we, we, we don't necessarily come in and take over every case. If you just want to consult with us on issue selection, research, drafting in the background, we consult with people all the time to help them improve their briefs. Um, and we can also obviously come in as counsel of record and handle the briefing. So um, with that, I if anyone wants to stay, I think Melanie and I are happy to stay for a few minutes and answer questions, um, or you can email us separately. But I know, I, I think we've come to the conclusion of our time, right, Lisa? We have. Okay. Um, so do you want us to stay and answer questions? I I don't see any in the q and A. I I think we answered. Oh, okay, Wait, got a couple, a couple of them. <laughs> Yeah, I don't see any. Oh, we had we do have to. Okay. Thank you for the person who said it was a, a good a good program. We appreciate that. Okay, the second the only question we haven't answered yet was, would you recommend any particular resource to build a basic understanding of this area of law? Um, let's see, I actually I have um, right over here, a book called the winning brief, which I think is a really um, terrific place that you can start um, Melanie, I don't know if you have any other resources off the top of your head. I mean, the rudder um, guide. For, yeah, yeah, for specific questions, the rudder civil guide is really helpful. But for a broader view, um, Charlie Bird, who um, sadly passed away last year, wrote a book. Um, I have it on my desk. I don't have the name of it, but it's, um, it, it's a great introduction to appellate practice and has some really good practical tips. Um, in it, so I, I would recommend getting that. I could, um, we could, we can email that to you along with the slides. The, the name of his book. I just pulled it up. It's um, so in addition to the winning brief, we would recommend it's called Advanced Topics in Appellate Practice: The Path to Mystery. And so Charlie was a longtime um, appellate mastery. Practice. Yeah, mastery. Uh, sorry, mastery, not mystery. <laughs> uh, the path, the path to mastery, and he talks about it being a journey. It's it is a path to 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 mastery. And so I think that that's another really great place. But as Melanie said, um, the law library has a copy of the Civil um, Appeals and Writs Rudder Guide. Um, there's a rudder guide both for Ninth Circuit practice and for um, California Court of Appeal practice. There's two different rudder guides. They're both really helpful if you have specific questions about writs and appeals. There's um, also um, a monthly, uh, it's called um, Civil Self-Help Workshop, and it Attorneys attend too, because we go through the very beginning from record designation, filing the notice of appeal, all the way at, to the end of request for rehearing. And it's a really good comprehensive summary of the appellate process. It's the first, the third Tuesday of every month. And so we encourage people who want to learn more about this area to, to attend and it's on Zoom. Okay, it looks like we have one more question. Uh... Oh, someone wants us to do another CLE. <laughs> um, we're happy to uh, to do that. We're always happy to have the law library and invite us back. Um, someone is asking to go back to the slide with our email addresses. You should have a copy of the PowerPoint. I believe Lisa sent it out at around 11:30 today. So you you should have everything that we that we talked about and all the slides we went through today, so that you can go back and study those if you want to look at those examples more closely. There's um, another question about um, how do you, you, you're interested in becoming an appellate attorney and how, how do you do that? Um, I, one thing is to, um, uh, there is a program called um, ATAJ, which um, allows uh, attorneys um, to represent, it, it connects attorneys with uh, pro per clients. Um, who don't have an attorney, can't afford attorney, low income. And um, it, it's a great way to be, have, get some experience in state court appellate um, uh, cases. And you can get oral argument and you can, and you get mentorship in this program. So um, there, there is a, it's called, the um, website is called appealhelp.org. And um, it has uh, information in it about how you apply to be a volunteer attorney in that. Um, what do you have other ways, Joanna, for um, uh, becoming? 
Yeah, I think that those that's some great advice. Um, you know, if, if that person is interested in talking offline about, um, you know, pursuing potentially a judicial clerkship or a research position, I could certainly, I'd be happy to talk to you about that. Um, that that program stands for access to appellate justice, and I will I will tout um, what was some of the work that we've been doing in the appellate community in San Diego for uh, almost a decade now. The program Melanie mentioned, um, the Cashew program, um, it, it was targeted at helping self um, represented litigants in the court of appeal be more prepared and understand the the process of an appeal. And then, so that was started maybe seven or eight years ago, um, and as a partnership between many organizations, including the law library. Um, and the County Bar Association. And then the Access to Appellate Justice Program, ATAJ, that Melanie mentioned. Um, the San Diego County Bar Association serves as a clearinghouse so that a self-represented litigant can come and say, I have this case where I don't have a lawyer, an appellate lawyer, and we have volunteer pro bono lawyers who then may opt in to handle the case. Um, and then if you're a junior attorney and you're willing to do that, you would get paired, as Melanie said, with a mentor who could help you. Uh, they're not gonna be counsel of record, but they can help um, guide you to resources. They may be willing to do uh, read your brief and do moot arguments with you um, to help you prepare and learn because we all know that you need um, practical, you know, practical experience um, in order- um, yes. Yeah, sorry. And I was going to say the other thing. I didn't need to turn. The other thing is, is that the courts right now, because I think you asked about going getting clerkships. The state courts are really um, hiring a lot because they don't have enough attorneys to who want to be research attorneys. They used to. They used to be very very difficult. Now there's more positions open, and so you can go on the California Court of Appeal here in San Diego and um, look at those job openings. Okay, so Lisa, I think we've gone a little over. I think we've answered all the questions um, that we had and we've gotten some more kudos in the, in the Q&A. So thank you for that, you all. Thank you all for coming and thank you, Lisa, for having us. Thank you, everybody.